Hey everyone, how's it going? Back on another episode of Candid Cannabis Conversations with your CPA. Today we have with us Chris Eggers. He's the CEO and founder of Cannabis Compliance Solutions or Cannabis Compliance Security Solutions. I'll let him introduce himself, but at a high level, he provides security for the cannabis industry from you know early stages of business all the way through post-revenue ongoing operating businesses of various scales. Um, coming to us out of California. So he's got a lot of uh, history and experience and we crossed paths. Why well, originally just selfishly wanted to bring him on as he was an undercover officer for a bit. And so there'll probably be some interesting questions around there. Um, but yeah, let's take it away, Chris. And you can introduce yourself. Right on, man. Thanks for having me, Ray. Appreciate uh, your time. So my name is Chris Eggers. I'm the CEO of CC Security Solutions, uh, Cannabis Compliance Security Solutions. We are based in California and serving clients nationwide. Um, all license types from pre-licensing, uh, helping folks uh, exit the, the legacy market and into the licensed market. And as you mentioned, all the way through um, operational facilities and businesses operating today. Nice. Obviously, part of the licensing process, you know, depending on the state, the security plan is part of it. Um, and so, but most people aren't security minded. You know, people don't grow up. Yes, we lock our houses and whatnot, but people don't go around thinking about how to secure their businesses. Um, and so with that in mind, like, how did you get into the, how did you learn about how to become a security expert, Chris? Sure. So, you know, I've, I've had an interest in cannabis for a very long time, uh, dating back before I was a police officer. Uh, I started my career with the Oakland police department and then, um, transferred to the San Francisco police department. I quit about two and a half years ago to start this venture. Um, and, you know, super excited to leave law enforcement, but have always had an interest in, in cannabis and the plant. Um, I was first, Introduced to it, I, I'll give you a brief story, I guess, on on how and why. But I have a family member who um, struggled with substance abuse for quite some time, um, and it's a relationship that was very close and, and near and dear to my heart. And in part through the use of cannabis, this individual now is um, successful on any barometer that matters. He's a great father. He's a great friend. Um, you know, he he's a he's a great dude all around. And and uh, it was in part through the use of cannabis that he was able to, um, you know, get better and and progress his his life forward. So I got to see that happen intimately. Um, you know, this individual lived within my household at one point in my life, um, and so I always had this this affinity for the plant and and this curiosity about it. I went into law enforcement, and you know, you're taught within law enforcement that it's you know, this gateway drug and it's the devil's lettuce and all of the yeah. training around cannabis is, is very negative. Um, and I, I mean, I'll, I don't want to, uh, I can be long winded, but let me just add this. The very last class that no, I no, took, go on. the very last class that I took before I quit law enforcement, I knew I was going to leave law enforcement for quite some time. So I invested a lot of time into various training that was available through police officer standard and training, which is called post in California. It's the DMV for your car post is for law enforcement. That is the governing body for law enforcement. So post training is available throughout the state with all types of topics. And I, and I constantly sought out cannabis specific training. And the very last course I took was an eight hour course up in Mendocino County about uh, cannabis DUI specifically. And the, the teacher, if you will, very much loosely uh, air quotes up here with the teacher, um, the course instructor had this huge, you know, massively negative connotation about cannabis and pointed at me specifically at one point during the class because I had my SFPD, you know, name tag. And he said, cannabis is the reason uh, for the opioid epidemic that is plaguing San Francisco today. And that Jeez. cannot be farther from the truth. Okay. Yeah. And there's somebody to, somebody to give that opinion. That person is me. And I'll tell you why. Um, one of the other trainings that I sought after prior to um, leaving law enforcement was what's called drug recognition expert training, DRE. Less than 2% of cops in California hold that designation. Um, so that's, you know, a small population right there. In addition to that, uh, you mentioned my previous undercover work, which I'm, if we can get into if you want, but you know, I feel strong and, and very confident in telling you that I haven't met anybody um, who's spoken to more people than myself that actively have a needle in their arm. Okay, so 
through my undercover work, there's there's a lot of misconceptions and assumptions that are made about myself professionally when people hear he used to work undercover. Okay. And that's fine. You know, I, I'm not in the business of, uh, of correcting people. Um, but I can tell you that through that experience, you learn a lot and you develop a lot of um, interesting relationships. Um, speaking to people who are actively using opioids, um, heroin, um, you know, other pills, et cetera, and learning about their story and learning and, and taking time to, to actually make connection with people. Um, one, you'll find that people want to share their story. They want to tell you about um, their evolution and, or, or, you know, how they got to be where they are. And okay. nobody um, shared that they, you know, got here with a needle in their arm um, because of cannabis. Um, that's yeah. just not, that's just not, that's just not real. And, you know, if, it, if you don't believe a DRE and you don't believe the guy who's, who's spoken to, you know, I don't know, over a hundred people who are actively using opioids and, and heroin, um, then I don't know who you, who you believe, but that's just not the case. And so, you know, here I am conflict, not, not conflicted. Cause I didn't, I didn't really enforce cannabis and as, as an officer, there's a lot of discretion you have if you're paying attention and you, and you mm -hmm. know, you're good at what you do, you know, you have a lot of discretion and that's not an area I ever really focused on or saw to be a problem. Um, but you know, it, it, it's interesting because I had this experience prior to law enforcement with somebody in my life who used cannabis to benefit their life in a significant way. And then you're taught, you know, uh, professionally over here, you know, how bad it yeah. is. You know, there's a lot of that going on today. Um, you know, we talk about that a lot with uh, a group I'm involved with, a new show, High at Nine. I contribute Mondays. Um, and, you know, we, we talk about that sometimes, but that negative connotation about cannabis still is very much real today, as we all know. Well, yeah, yeah. Like I live in Wisconsin, so our state legally doesn't even recognize the medical benefits of cannabis. Like there's no medical program. There's no, obviously no adult use program. And so they're getting better. You know, but, you know, it's at least not talked about in the D.A.R.E. programs that weed is the gateway drug. But like for sure, when I was in grade school, like there's still the D.A.R.E. program. Weed is a gateway drug. Um, it's getting a lot better, but for sure, there's still negative connotations. You know, there's less than 25 states have adult use. So the medical side has made great strides and, you know, respect to that. Love it. Um, but we still have a lot long ways to go with cannabis use and just, you know, getting the stigma aside so people can get access to the medicine they need and education realistically for, you know, users, children, adults, everything. That's yeah. really interesting. Okay. It's then so there. the negative connotation continues and affects businesses in other ways. And I'll give you one more quick example. I was, okay. a, I was, a, I was a foot beat officer in San Francisco. I was wearing the, the funny hat walking around yeah. pointing out where the cable car was to the tourists on, on market street. Right? Picture it now with like a baton at the whole nine it, yards, exactly. bad, shiny. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, and I, I, I like to think of myself as a, as a bit of a chatty Cathy, you know, I'm, yeah. I like to talk to people. I like to interact with people. And um, this dispensary opened up right on my beat. And it was a dispensary and now, now it's a dispensary consumption lounge, but, but very important part of the story is the consumption lounge was not operational at this point of my story. And, uh, and I'm walking by and I kind of make, you know, eyes with the, with the manager and we both kind of head nod and wave. And I walk over, I hand him my card and uh, I'm like, Hey man, I'm, I'm Chris. Like I usually post up over here. If you need anything, like welcome to the neighborhood. Here's where you can find mm -hmm. me. Let me know if you need anything. He's like, you want a tour? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Can I come in? He's like, I don't know. Yeah. Can you? I'm like, absolutely. You know, why not? <clears throat> so, you know, tour the place. It's really cool. Um, good vibe. And I'm coming out, you know, say, say goodbye. And I'm coming out and in the middle of market street is uh, one of my sergeants at the time and didn't really respect her or think this person was that great of a, at what they do to begin with, but not my point. Okay. Um, you know, he weighs me over, you know, and he says to me, I want you to stay out of those places. And I know we don't know each other that well, but my response was like, no, a very quick and like pointed no. I'm like, absolutely not, man. Like, and at this point, you have to understand too, I know I'm on my way out. So um, I'm really mm -hmm. just totally being me. Um, right, right. Just telling you to like protect and yeah, serve, but not that not, business. Man. Yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> what? So I, said, listen, I said, listen, if you want me to stay out of these places, put that in an email, put your name behind it and shoot me an email, something that I can tangibly hold that says you, my supervisor, want me to stay out of a retail, a licensed retail establishment that pays rent, pays taxes, you know, employs people. 
yeah. is required to have security camera footage that we're going to rely on the minute there's an accident out on Market Street in front of this place. That's the first door we're going to go to because we know that they're required to have various security equipment and in, in, yep, in things yep. in place. And the retail location next door, whether it be a liquor store or a Gap, what doesn't matter, is not required to have those things. So go ahead, shoot me that email. And then when I get that email, I'll make sure I stay out of these places. And I turned around and walked right back in <laughs> just to say, just to say goodbye again, you know, and, oh, man. and just like that That's... negative connotation is, is very real. And this was not that long ago. Um, yeah, I was going to say, it's not that long ago and it's in California, which like being a stereotypical Midwesterner, like people in Wisconsin just assume everybody in California loves weed and that weed is everywhere and cannabis is very prevalent. And like, I can assure you, like I've only been in California once, but like it, it's not everywhere. And so there's a stigma still in California, you know, like quote a Mecca, so to speak of cannabis and, you know, the West, it's definitely going to be in these other new emerging markets for sure. So even though every few months there's a new adult use market that comes online, it's still very much, you know, a lot of blocking and tackling is still involved. And once the state legalizes, as you know, it's still a jurist, you know, it's city by city after that. And so some cities will opt out. Um, and so anything we can do to move the move the industry forward compliantly, ethically, and to destigmatize around cannabis is it's definitely still needed um, for sure. So that's okay. interesting. And then, so what was your transition then specifically? Like you knew you wanted to get out of <clears throat> law enforcement. How did you know you wanted to get into the owning a security business, specifically serving the cannabis industry? Because like I came from my old company um, before I got into cannabis, I actually did security, but they did it for like high rises on an international scale. It was like ADT, it was one of their security brands and Brink. So you can do security for any other industry. So why did you choose the cannabis industry, Chris, to do uh, security for? Right. So that's a that's a interesting question, and and a, I'll make the long answer as short as possible because security means right. different things to different people, right? And yeah, yeah. I'll lead with what I thought I was getting into was this very narrow path of security consulting, and what we very quickly learned was how disconnected and bad the current status quo of cannabis security is. And so, you know, the answer is we are unapologetically disruptive to that status quo. Um, cannot stress unapologetically disruptive because it's a disconnected patchwork of various vendors, services, service providers with one-sided contracts, no allocation of risk. It's expensive, it's disconnected, and it typically leads to a multi-vendor blame game. And the people who matter the most, the operators who are trying to keep this business going and their employees employed and, you yeah. know, um, money running through their business and quality product out the door to the patients and clients and, and customers who want it and seek it, you know, those are the most important people. And we very quickly identified that those are the people that are getting jacked the most, excuse my language. Yeah. And unfortunately, so we are unapologetically chasing a different carrot to be very clear. Um, you know, there's a lot of security consultants in the cannabis space and I know all of them, if, if you know, most of them, if not all of them, um, but you know, they're, they're in their lane and we're on our own lane, you know, we're focused on our lane. There's no traffic in your lane and we can focus on our clients in our lane and, and the market tells us and our client success tells us that what we're doing in our approach is real and it works. Um, and ultimately we are, you know, in part increasing, uh, security coverage, reducing corporate and professional liability and reducing overall security costs. And that was discovered, you know, early on in, in this venture, when we looked at and started understanding the landscape of cannabis security today. Um, but how I got into it, you know, on the personal side, I, I met my, my, my now wife, who I knew immediately um, was my person and, and she's a unicorn. I'm like, so lucky. Um, nice. And, Congratulations. And thanks. Thank you. We met in San Francisco um, and she's from uh, um, the, the West city Coast. of love. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and, and she's from uh, uh, the Lake Tahoe region. So I knew that okay. you know, moving out of San Francisco Bay Area was in the cards, um, you know, and almost a guarantee. Um, and at, at the same time, you know, I was getting very frustrated being um, working within that law enforcement cog. San Francisco mm -hmm. PD is a unique place. Um, I don't think it's that great. I think the quality of officers is pretty low. Uh, certainly compared to a place like Oakland where you don't have the resources and and you do need to be um, you know good at, at, at a lot of things. I'm not saying every cop in Oakland is good at all the things, but you know, I was fortunate enough to be mentored by 
um, people who I respect and, and, and they, the communities that we serve respected them as well, which is, um, you know, the, a big barometer, right. To go off of. And yeah. my experience with Oakland was, was very unique, you know, and working undercover was, uh, interesting. And I got to, to learn a lot about the criminal mindset, um, how offenders think and move and operate. Um, and you know, that's an education that there's no initials after my name for that. Right. Um, yeah. It, world there's a lot of, of fancy initials people throw back there but there's there's no initials for the education that I got working in Oakland um and wasn't super happy with San Francisco so that's that's generally the uh reason a couple of the reasons I left you know professionally was a little bit unhappy and then personally um super stoked and, and happy uh but knew that we were going to eventually move out of the Bay Area okay very cool very cool and then do you where do you live now? Where is the company headquartered? Um, do you guys have an HQ or are you digitally native? Where are you, where are you guys at yeah, now? We're, we're generally digitally native. Um, uh, great terminology. Um, we have, uh, you know, folks. I just learned the, that word a few weeks ago. So that's why yeah. I use it now. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> um, so we have, we have folks in, in various parts of the state and the country. Um, okay. You know, I'm, I'm a short drive to, you know, where a lot of our clients are in the Bay Area. Um, we have a presence down in Southern California, uh, in, and in the Midwest. Um, but you know, our client base is, is expanding and obviously COVID taught not only us, but a lot of people and, and most of, I think the workforce at some point that, you know, you can do, um, a lot from a re remote location. And, and then the other thing that, you know, as we're growing and my company is growing pretty quickly and significantly, you know, to keep overhead costs low and to just put on my business hat, right? Um, you know, yeah. how we want to evolve this business and how we want to push this forward in a responsible way so that we can continue to keep our costs low, which uh, in part helps keeping our, our client costs low as well. So, um, you know, that, that's where we are today. And we've evolved significantly since we started and, and we continue to grow. So who knows, um, you know, where things will go, but, you know, that's that's generally where we are at right now. I like that. I like that. And yeah, I mean, we're a scaling business ourselves. It's always interesting kind of you want to scale quickly, but not too quickly where the the quality of the service or the product diminishes. And so it's always that like tit for tat of like scaling, but keeping, you know, taking a pause, make sure everything's still quality is very, very high. I like that. Um, and then kind of just I had taken some notes off to the side, but the big focus of your guys is like when you say you're disruptive on purpose, which I like that. I think there's a lot of industries that we can use cannabis as almost a springboard to disrupt other industries because it's like the birth of an industry. So you can kind of see it from the beginning. Um, but increasing the coverage of security, reducing the cost of security and reducing the risks of security. That's kind of the main three pillars that you improve for your clients more or less, right? Yeah. Reducing liability, increasing coverage and reducing costs. Um, you know, the status quo for security, and, and we're just talking about cannabis security, right? Which is just a yep, piece. Yep, yeah, of it's just cannabis. I mean, it's just, you know, security is a, is a significant, but a piece of, you know, what operators need to be concerned about and, and work through and what's regulated on the state and local levels. We, as a lot of us know, um, <clears throat> you know, but there's so many other, other consideration points that operators need to need to tackle. But with with cannabis security specifically, you know, we listen, the, the status quo is you have to engage multiple different vendors to um, encompass your entire security pie. Right. And yep. there's the one sided contracts and there's the no allocation of risk, the inability to audit, the inability to manage uh, when things go wrong, people blaming each other. You know, how do I get so and so on the phone to come fix this issue when he says it's it's this person's issue? I mean, these are real everyday pain points that operators are facing. And, you know, again, we very quickly identified that we believe there's a better mousetrap out there. And um, we feel strong and confident today in saying that we are changing the paradigm of cannabis security. Um, it needs to change. And, you know, the, nice. the I, would, I would say is within our growing client base. Um, all of our growth has been 100% organic. Um, we don't currently today utilize outside sales. Um, and we're just trying to keep up with the growth of, of, you know, um, continuing to add value to to folks that find us, whether it be through a previous experience or vendor, um, or you know, they they are now starting to maybe consume our content. Uh, but typically, our our client base uh, comes from referrals from existing clients um, in nice. their groups and and their you know folks that they interact with. 
you know, every day this industry becomes more aware that, you know, not only are there very specific pain points that are specific to cannabis, but that there's a better way of doing things, a more efficient way of doing things. Specifically, yeah. when investors get the picture because they come from other industries where, you know, it's like, hey, this isn't done that way. Why is it done this way? Um, you know, a quick example is a service level agreement. Those are generally non-existent in cannabis today. And we're developing, uh, or I'm sorry, we have developed one uh, for a small piece of our offering. Um, and, you know, part of that is the education to the end user of, hey, here's why this is important. You know, if you buy this service and it doesn't work, why are you paying that full price for that service, right? With no way to get it working, you know? I mean, that's just that's just crazy. Um, and yeah. so there's a lot of pain points around it. And gosh, I could rabbit hole, I'm sorry, but. Um, no, no, I, I, I love what I'm hearing here. Just thinking through, kind of take a step back of just, <clears throat> you're, you're getting out of, um, getting out of law enforcement, getting into security, owning your own business. Just like a fun question I like to ask people is like, thinking through your first cannabis client, what was the, you know, who was your first cannabis client? How did you find them? What did you sell to them? Com and then compared to your last client, what are you selling now? Just because like, as you said, as we get better as business owners, you know, and we learn over time, like our offerings get better, they improve and they get a little bit more refined. So yeah, I guess let's just start with your first client. You know, who are they? How did you find them? And what did you do for them? Because it is always, you know, starting your business is it's interesting. It's scary. Getting that first dollar to come across the bridge is very important. Whether, you know, you're cultivating your first bit of flour and you're selling your first pounds or selling your first bit of CFO services or security services, it's interesting. So yeah, what was yeah. your first client like? What's yeah, the story my first, there? My first client um, was a cultivator up in uh, a rural area of Northern California. And this individual was having various issues um, with uh, petty theft, and, and it escalated from there. I'll just keep it high level. Um, mm -hmm. So we were engaged to do a security assessment, which you know we're we're still doing today. Um, but but back then the deliverable is the is the same deliverable today. It's a very comprehensive report, um, itemized and categorized by priority to help uh, somebody who is not security minded understand where the pitfalls are and where they lie within their business. You know, security yeah. and security folks love to get really technical uh, and in the nitty gritty. But, you know, we're talking about somebody who sole, one of their sole goals is to grow quality cannabis. Their goal isn't to then also become a security expert, right? Because yeah. then they become yeah. an over control expert and, uh, and all these other things, right? So, you know, our approach is a little bit different in that we want to help people understand, um, you know, what the deliverable is and value of it so that they can utilize that to their, to their benefit, right? Again, Adding value to the people who matter should not be a concept that's like nuts, right? I mean, but unfortunately in cannabis, there's a lot of bad actors and there's just a lot of people getting jacked and, and engaged with bad folks and, um, you know, green tax and the horror stories that we all hear about, those absolutely yeah. exist in cannabis security. So the deliverable was a, was a report to help this person identify what risk exists today and then generally a path forward. But at that time, we weren't executing on the path forward. We were we were still okay. very much true consultants. So he still had to go out and we could help him do this, but vet vendors to do the, the various work. We've evolved to a place today okay. uh, in part, uh, largely in part of acquiring our, our low voltage partner um, where we are executing on installations. We are executing on the problem um, and the solution. Um, you know, and then we've evolved in other ways as well. So, you know, our clients today, um, only see and deal with, you know, CCSS. Um, there's not much we don't do in-house. We are licensed in California as a guard company as well, um, you know, and, and a few other uh, deliverables. So there's not much that we don't do in-house, but what we don't do in-house um, is, is in part done through partnerships that are connected to very specific uh, master subcontractor agreements, which allow us to dig our teeth into and solve the problem if there is one. Um, and that's that's one of the biggest problems in cannabis security that we find is, again, the inability to audit and manage um, a vendor, right? And then again, leading to that multi-vendor blame game. So we remove that barrier in two ways. One, by acting as that one point of contact. Um, and then two, in the background, you know, if we have a subcontractor now, again, we vetted this, this company, we've done, you know, extensive due diligence, and they are uh, contractually obligated to do what they say they're going to do. 
and there's a clear path forward if there's any deviation from that. So, you know, we're removing those barriers for our end user operator, um, the client, so that when they're talking about security, they're not dealing with, you know, all these multiple vendors. Um, they're just dealing with, you know, one entity, which saves them yeah. Yeah. and a ton of time, a ton of headache and ultimately significant amounts of money as well. Oh man. And that, that's the, that is the rub too, is like the implementation. Um, I remember my time on Wall Street, you know, dealing with a huge company. So it's like we had endless funds. So we had consultants for everything. Um, and it was just like hilarious. They would just come in be like, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. Like, all right, cool. How do we fix it? And they'd be like, you got to figure it out. And like, sometimes yeah. they would even like point you, they give you like directional, like you're spending too much money here. You should probably spend less. Like, all right, cool. Can you, we implement processes and procedures to spend less like no nah, that's not what i do i'm a consultant they just peace out you're like god yeah. you pieces of shit like you don't do anything you literally walk through point things out collect a fat paycheck and leave no implementation it's like we get a report and then we create a tiger team and then we got to create the initiatives drive this report forward to the finish line and we didn't even write it and so i think you really figured it out chris where it's like it's one thing to be a consultant because we do the same thing you know on the finance side it's like there's finance managers, you know, finance consultants, finance advisors, like it's endless. And, uh, but they don't do anything. They like come in, they're like, Hey, this is how you should do your tax strategy, <laughs> but they don't implement shit. And so it's like the consultants are actually fairly useless in the grand scheme of things. So the goal is to like start as a consultant, but then become the actual true solution where the consultant is what gave us the expertise to know what the solution is, but actually implementing the solution multiple times is where we build the rapport and the quality is because we've actually implemented it, which then feeds back into the consulting because like we actually had to implement a solution. So you think through it slightly differently when you're actually implementing everything that you've just seen wrong. And so kudos to you for kind of solving that problem. And obviously I'm sure it will evolve over time and you'll bring more things in house. Um, but I like solving the implementation. And even if you can't bring it in house, Chris, where you guys said like you control, you still control the implementation where they, they have to use a third-party vendor. It's somebody that you have already vetted with, with CCSS. You guys know each other. You speak on a regular basis. You're almost going to quality assess their work. Um, and so I think that's actually very sorely needed in cannabis and, you know, in many respects. So that's that's pretty awesome there. Thank you. Um, and, and just let me add, too, like we're, we're vendor independent. Yeah. So one, one, of the, one of the dirty tricks that happens in cannabis security from a consultant point, right? And this is this is... Yeah what I want people, especially operators to really understand is, you know, be careful when these recommendations are being made and ask the questions, you know, how and why is this the solution that you're recommending for me, right? Because what's ha what happens in cannabis security is, hey, I'm going to go make a recommendation uh, over here and this is your solution and it's commission-based. And that's why I'm- Yeah, I'm, what's your kickback? Right? But that's, that's why that recommendation is being made. And that was another pain point within, within the status quo that we looked at. We're like, this is, this is absolutely horrible because if I'm an operator, I don't want to be handcuffed into this solution because my consultant, air quotes, you know, is making yeah. a based recommendation, um, not, not really factoring in what my specific use and needs are. So, and, and listen, we all want to make referrals to good people and good partners and, and, and referrals, I, I believe, are, are generally OK when done on, you know, above board. But we all need to consider and factor in, you know, who's benefiting here. And the answer needs yeah. to be the operator. You know, the, the, the plant touching business is the answer. Um, and so that's that's another problem that we're fixing within within cannabis security is removing that that level of barrier, if you will. Um, and it's really important for people to understand that that does occur today, every day. Um, and so ask oh, questions, yeah. you know, why, why are you choosing this vendor? Why this recommendation? Why this solution? You know, what are my other options? I'm constantly, you could call anybody who's called CCSS in, in this, you know, I mean, call anybody that's called CCSS and, and spoken right. to me. I'm constantly saying, Hey, go out there and go fact check this, you know, go out there into the status quo, go get multiple proposals. But read the yeah, terms. yeah. Go talk to the competition. I like that. But yeah, go out there. Ask these questions, you know, because you're going to yes. get a whole bunch of, uh, well, you know. Yeah, it makes them uncomfortable, actually, when they start talking to the competition, asking the right questions. And that's kind of it, right? It's like these business owners, they don't even know what questions to ask for some of these professional services because they're very intelligent business owners and they know how to grow 
product or sell it or whatever their specialty is, but you know, they didn't go to school for accounting or security services. And so to your point, they could become an expert for sure. It'll take you a little bit of while. You're going to have to take a lot of time and energy to do it, or you could just work with experts. And so, because again, like if you understand things a bit better, you'll ask better questions. And so, yeah, speaking with these business owners and doing that education piece almost, so to speak, is it's it's very much important for these growing industries and it helps get the conversations get a lot better when people are asking the the better questions or the right questions, so to speak. Um, and on that note, do you guys do anything, Chris, as far as like education, um, you know, like security, cannabis business security 101 for cultivators and retailers or do you guys, how do you, how do you differentiate your clients and do you offer any educational stuff? We do. We have uh, a ton of educational content. Uh, so cool. early on, nice. we were fortunate enough to work with Oaksterdam University um, and be selected by the city of Los Angeles and their regulatory body down there, the DCR, as their subject matter experts in cannabis security. Um, and we had very strict uh, parameters placed on us when it came to educational content development for um, specifically social equity applicants. And organically, we started talking about risk management, which I, I would argue generally doesn't exist in cannabis today. Um, and they came back to That's us. That's a fair said, argument. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's like a nice way of putting it, right? Um, yeah. And so they came back to us and said, hey, they removed some of the some of the parameters and wanted us to continue to talk about risk management. And, you know, what does that mean? Why is it important? Mm -hmm. How is it affecting businesses? And on a very high level, you know, we need to um, understand how important insurance and other landlord tenant agreements, et cetera, are when we're designing and building out the, the um, electronic security system and exterior fortifications and general security program of a facility. Because, you know, burglaries and robberies today are certainly increasing in frequency and increasing in violence, but that's not the only thing that's decimating businesses. It's the recovery or lack of recovery from, again, it's the expensive um, repairs, you know, and, and things that could be done uh, to prevent this act or slow this yeah. act down um, that are really leading to cost savings long-term and, and keeping businesses afloat. Um, but, you know, risk management doesn't exist generally. And we started talking about that. So uh, in part, yeah, we do. Uh, yes, we do education around this topic and a lot of blogs, a lot of LinkedIn posts, a lot of webinars. Um, we've been approached, uh, you know, at various speaking engagements across the country as well. And, um, nice. Looking forward to making a, a big announcement here soon about our next speaking engagement. So, you know, I think as the industry becomes more sophisticated and yeah. uh, people start to understand, you know, that the way we've been doing things, you know, the last X amount of years um, is not sustainable, specifically with cannabis security uh, yeah. and risk management, that there needs to be a change. And, you know, we're, we're just quietly... Um, you know, helping as many people as we can. Um, you know, we're we're growing and and we're basing our success on the success of our clients. And you know, again, I think that uh, a change needs to happen. And and you know, we're focused on what we're doing over here, and and our clients are having some success with it. I like that. I like that. Um, that's what you had mentioned about kind of the the electronic security piece um, just kind of reminded me of some trainings I used to do back in the day um, because cybersecurity is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, companies are getting robbed, not at gunpoint, but they will essentially like cybersecurity now is you know, they just, it's, they hold all of their data. It's like, they can't run the enterprise when all of their data is seized and they can't get into the softwares they need to get into and they need to release the, uh, you know, the access. Do you guys do anything as far as cybersecurity or is it mainly like the physical security -ness of the facilities? What do you guys, how do you bridge yeah. that gap? So there's a lot of crossover, right? I mean, it's like a Venn diagram. I mean, there's a lot of crossover, yeah. cybersecurity, physical, physical security, risk management, uh, and various SOPs. Now, when it comes to, you know, um, true cybersecurity, that is not um, my wheelhouse. Um, okay. To mean that we're we don't have some chops to help people understand you know where where some issues may arise but you know again i think it's extremely important for um people to stay and define in their own lanes right yeah. so we, right. we do have the ability to help people if they have cybersecurity needs uh typically those needs come with other needs as well so there's a, there's a bit of a i don't know if cross pollination might be the right word and a bit of a pun here but you know there's um Definitely cybersecurity needs that cross into our into our true wheelhouse often. And, and that's something that we in part help um, clients with, but not 
not specifically uh, today. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one other question I had kind of, because Minnesota just came online, that is the closest state to me. So, you know, a lot of flurry of activity, you know, the business teams are coming together. They're starting to figure out who, who are the teams that are going to apply for the licenses? Where's the real estate going to be secured? Where's the funding going to come from for this business endeavor? Um, and so I always kind of chuckle of like, who, you know, who makes these rules as an auditor, you know, for the early parts of my career, like we were always auditing to policy or auditing to standards. You know, if it was a company, we, you know, as auditors, we have our own <clears throat> gap, you know, standards that we have to adhere to. And then as, as we audit, there's a whole nother set of, you know, gas standards that we have to audit against. Um, so who makes, like, who are the governing bodies for the security requirements on the license application? Um, can you just shed a little bit of light onto that of where you guys kind of work with companies in the licensing phases and maybe even the state level of like, what should the requirements be for these, you know, cannabis cultivators or cannabis retail locations? Sure. I think the, the way I'd like to answer that question is, is a little bit on a high level, just for people to understand that aren't aware that there are very specific state requirements and then very specific local or municipality requirements. And they don't always align with each other. And there are oftentimes um, a, a very big disconnect and even um, some regulations on the state level or local level that don't match, you know, the other one. And so... Mm -hmm. That's that's like the first point I'd like to make. And then yeah, the and that's point, a good point to make too, because it's it's cannabis, right? Like everybody thinks it's uniform. It's because the state goes legal, everyone does it the same. It's like, dude, no, like even the real estate, it's like getting real estate city to city, it can be totally different if whatever their municipalities. So I, I totally agree. I'm glad you touched on that point to clarify that they're they're yeah, different. They're, and they're and they can be contradictory, to be perfectly candid. I know, like so, oh man. And so yeah. it's like, hey, hey, so this municipality, you know, we're working through this in 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 an area of California right now, where the municipality requirements are a little bit contradictory to the state requirements. And so, you know, when we are submitting documents, application documents, it's important to, you know, have some sort of line into an interaction with somebody on the local level, right? And my my background with law enforcement, I understand how local municipalities work. I mean, I can speak that language like breathing. Yeah. So okay. Being able to cut through, you know, some of the uh, smoke and mirrors, I think is the appropriate way to say it on a on a podcast. Um, you know, being mm -hmm. able to cut through some of that that BS, right, um, is is imperative yeah. because there's contradictory language that can occur, and you know, municipalities are typically always right, right? Um, it's it's so hard to, if, if you're unaware of that world, it's so, it can be very difficult to navigate. So that that's a, that's a point I'd, I'd like people to understand that there are two different requirements typically that you need to check the box on. One of the biggest mm -hmm. mistakes that we see people make is, is doing just that, is taking these regulations as checking the box. Hey, I just need to do the bare minimum to get through this process. And I understand to some degree, that mentality, because the barriers to entry can be extremely high. Um, yeah. How, yeah. You know, that always in our, in our experience is the more expensive option long-term. Um, and it's important. And again, as, as money gets funny in, in cannabis and, and harder to raise money, um, you know, investors are starting to listen a lot more to a different way of doing things. Um, and then that's driving how operators are, are looking at making decisions. And we yep. see it all the time, you know, and it just comes down to solving problems. So, yeah. So when it comes to regulations, you know, that's, that's a, that's an aspect, but that's not where the game ends. You know um, one of the biggest issues again, is that risk management piece, you know, compliance with insurance policy requirements and safeguards specifically, a lot of even seasoned operators are unaware that there are requirements that need to be met. And when the bad thing happens and they call up their insurance company and the insurance company conducts an audit and finds that they were non-compliant in X amount of areas, whether it be, you know, not the right types of locks or doors or safes or what have you. I could riff for hours about this, you know. Yeah, yeah. Then, or the, the footage of the back. recorder doesn't record long enough. And so. Right. Huh. right. You know, so all these issues compile to the end user and they're eventually told. And this is, again, extremely common, not talked about openly. And I'm not sure why. But should be, you know, when that operator is stuck with nowhere to turn because the insurance company didn't do what they expected, but the insurance company is hanging their hat on, hey, you didn't meet these requirements, you know, and they're like, hey, I, I was signed off by the state, I was signed off by the city, I had officer so and so walk through my place and give me a thumbs up and what do you mean I'm not compliant, 
you know, it's important for people to understand that, you know, the state requirements, the local requirements are not the only things uh, that need to be considered when when developing and designing a space. And I'm only talking about, again, a small piece of your operational world, although although a very important piece, but a piece, I wouldn't say a small piece, but a piece is security, right? Because again, we have odor control, we have inventory management, we've got employees, we've got HR, we've got finances, yeah, accounting, our CFO. there's tons of SOPs. Oh, I mean, there's just, the list goes on. I mean, anybody who started a small business, you know, and, and I'm I'm a guy who did that, you know, understand a lot of moving parts. And so, yeah, exactly. You know that, okay, this is my pain point and this is real, but I've got 20 other pain points, you know? And so yeah, it's, it's, it's prioritizing the pain points. And like, if you really know your business, which sounds like you do, it's like, you, there's, there's always things that can be fixed. And so it's like prioritizing with limited time, money and personnel, the resources, like how do, what do we address first? And we just try to get 1% better every day or every week. Um, to your point, so security is not always front of mind, unfortunately. But to your point, it's it's one of those things where it's it's just so important to have it dialed in for the event where you get a break in or something else happens and goes sideways. Um, now it's the same with like audits. We preach the same thing to our clients. It's like if you don't do these things correctly, when you do get audited, or if you do, and you most likely will in cannabis in some time of a 10 year, if you're successful enough to run it for 10 years you're going to get tagged with an audit. So like, that's why you do these preventative measures. So in the case of the worst case scenario, you know, you're good. Um, it's going to happen at some point, you know, or it is, it is. And, and cannabis will get there too. It's just, it's, they haven't seen enough cycles yet because it's, it's only 10, 20 years old at most in some of the most developed markets and realistically zero to four years old in the majority of the markets or the rest of them. So no, I think we're going the right direction. Let's wrap this call up in a little bit here. Um, Chris, this was a, a joy chatting with you. You're definitely very knowledgeable in the cannabis industry and specifically your niche of uh, security for the cannabis industry. So let people know where they can find you, um, kind of where you're going to be for the rest of the 2023, if they're going to be at any events or expos and uh, yeah, where they can find you. Awesome, man. Well, again, thanks for having me, Ray. It's been, you know, we've talked a couple of times, you know, outside of the Zoom and, and you know, I, uh, I, I have a lot of respect for what you guys are doing. Uh, and the value that you're bringing because it's real um, and and very much needed. So thank you for having me here today. Um, you can find us on Instagram, CC Security Solutions. Um, our website is ccsecuritysolutions.com. Uh, Chris at ccsecuritysolutions.com. And if we're hard to find, I need to call my SEO folks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah. So we'll be uh, we'll be attending MJ Impact in Detroit. Um, okay. I. I have a lot of respect for that organization and and the quality of uh, uh, attendee and vendors that are there. Um, we're looking at a couple other shows. You know, we'll we'll attend um, MJ BizCon to some degree and likely throw a, a happy hour. So hit me up. Uh, we'll get nice. you there too. So. Vegas and Detroit should be a good time. Yeah, absolutely. Detroit's an awesome city. Um, I I really do. I think it's cool. But yeah, man, this has been fun. And, and, you know, I think that conversations like this are so important, you know, even if, um, you know, I, I just think that there's got to be a better way to be doing things as we move forward. And when you start to really listen to operators and what their pain points are, you know, and then you go and you look at what is being talked about, let's say on like a LinkedIn, you know, there's a big disconnect there, right? People are not looking yeah. for, you know, to be sold the thing, you know, they just want their problem solved and they want to be heard and they don't want to be taken mm -hmm. to and they want it to work, you know, and they want, if it, if something does go wrong, because things are not hundred percent perfect, you know, but when things go wrong, they want to be able to pick up the phone and get a solution, you know, and get somebody on the other end who, who gives a, you know, what, um, and I think yeah, that yeah, that genuinely that's cares. Still lacking. That's still very much lacking, unfortunately, in this industry as we really, you know, drill down and, and, you know, again, we're shoulder to shoulder with our clients when things happen, right? And, and yeah, we're the, when, when the bad thing happens, we're oftentimes, um, you know, for the people who become clients, right, where they're one of the first phone calls they make, like, hey, I had this issue, you know, I really need it solved yesterday, yeah. you know, uh, how do we do that? You know, and how we do that in a way that, you know, again, benefits them and benefits their business. That's the goal. Um, and if we could do that, you know, we're going to we're going to continue to bring value and um, attract other people who are like minded in that in that regard as well. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So anybody who had a pleasure to listen to this again, this is Chris Eggers with Cannabis Compliance Security Solutions, CCSS. 
again, he cares. He's responsive. He's proactive. He's done this before. I do believe the industry is hungry for professionals like you and myself here that care and are focused on this industry moving it forward um, because we can't continue what we've done to get here. What we've done to get here is great and it was needed. And now we're to this point in the industry, but I align with you as well as going forward. It, it'll be a slightly different trajectory going forward, but it'll be better for everybody, for the industry, for the plant, for the you know people who use it and need it. Um, but that being said, I'll talk to you later. And, Thanks, uh, yeah. Be well, Chris. All right, man. Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. I think I can just stop recording here. Right, awesome second. photo. Awesome photo you got there. I like that shirt. <laughs> I tell appreciate me, it. I appreciate it.